the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God. Y la sopa, no, no. La sopa, la sopa picante, ¿se acuerda? Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. It's good to have you folks here. Okay. Amen. Yep. Jose, good to see you. Jose. And of course, our faithful computer tech genius, Eric. <laughs> so, supposed to be another person here, but I guess they didn't quite find the place yet. But uh, they'll be here. I'm glad. pretty much assured of that from what I've God, been a couple I've spoken to. So, so today we will study the parsha a more, which means speak. You go. And if we kind of refer back to really what Vaikra is all about, it's about the holiness of Hashem, about His order and the way in which we act and conduct ourselves in honoring Him. In amongst the Levitical priesthood, as one particular group that God has certain expectations and orders to follow, and the nation of Israel. Because not everybody can be a Levite. <laughs> it's just not the way the real world works. God made so many poles for the Mishkan. And that's what he needed. And he chose the ones that he needed. And he made them. So if you want to be something in the kingdom of God... Just be what Yehovah, Hashem, created you to be and called you to be. Don't try to be somebody else because he didn't fit you for the suit in order to wear that that you desire to do. And so... We're in Vayikra 21, 1 to 24, 3. It says initially, and I want to just kind of, this is, I'm just going to give you an outline, more or less, because this is really directed toward the, the Levites. And so, Hashem gives us certain instructions for them. It says that he may not make himself unclean. In other words, a Levite, a priest, those caring for the things of Hashem. He's not to make himself unclean because he's a leader among his people. To do that, to make himself unclean, would profane him. Now, when we think of that word profane, I'm sure people have several different definitions. Some may think it's perverted. Some may think it's bad. Some may think it's dirty or, or just, you know, not motivated to do good things. But actually, in the Hebrew, it means something very simple. It's to put a place or a thing or a person in an environment doing the things that they weren't meant to do. There was one order for the Levites. And there was one order of that which was holy to Israel. Okay? One expectation 
for the Levites in order to walk holy before Hashem and one for the Israelites, the tribes, the nation, the, not the nations, the tribes, the 12 tribes, to conduct themselves in a holy manner within that construct, order. And so, but it also says that both Levite and Israel followed the same law. So they both had the same law and expectations of Hashem to follow the mitzvot, but the, I would say, the Levites were held to a higher standard. And so when, when a Levite was kind of associating himself or lowering his standards down to the standards that Hashem established for Israel, the tribes, they were profaning God's holy order, God's holy way, concerning them. And vice versa, the tribes, the common person, if he attempted to raise himself up into a status or functioning in a role as a Levite, he was profaning the holiness of God. Because he didn't belong there. He was not portioned to walk in those spheres. God appointed who he appointed, and that was his choice. And so, what we basically see here is in chapter 21, where God begins to explain some things to the Levites. And I want to say that as well as believers, God calls certain individuals to a certain place in his kingdom to carry out certain responsibilities in conjunction with their seeking him and fulfilling the purpose for which he created them, the books that he's written on all the days of their lives appointed to by God to carry out priestly orders, priestly um, duties. And we have to be mindful that we're not stepping over into certain responsibilities that God never intended us to have. It's really important. And so, basically, it's interesting that he begins to outline those things. As a Kohanim, you're not to make any bald spots on their heads. Now, why would I want to make bald spots on my head? I don't know. But that was something that was important then. They're not to mar the edges of our beards. We're not to cut them. Or gash your flesh. Rather, they are to be holy for their God and not profane the name of their God. So if you engage in the do's and the don'ts, you're ignoring God. You're profaning the very purpose for which he called you out from the world and set you apart to be part of his kingdom. To whatever extent whether a Levite, it says that 
we were made kings and priests. I believe that carries over into modern times. Clearly, unequivocally, Jews are clearly kings and priests. Clearly are. In the renewed covenant, says that we're not to profane the name of our God. For they are the ones who represent Adonai with offerings made by fire, the bread of their God, therefore they must be holy. So as a believer in Yeshua, as a believer in Yehovah, two separate functioning parts of the kingdom of God that fulfills certain manifestations of the presence of God. As I said before, Yeshua will always be a servant king. He will always be a humble servant king, acting on behalf of the Creator, of the Father. He is where He is the visible image of the invisible God that dwells with man. And so, as well, He's required as a Kohen, you're not to marry a woman who is a prostitute. Now, of course, we know Yeshua is not married. It's not part of the purpose of who he is. Who has been profaned or who has been divorced because he is holy for his God. So you can't marry a prostitute who's been profaned or been divorced. Why? Because he's holy. He's set apart. And we need to observe that in our own lives. Who are you? Where are you? And where has Hashem set you apart to fulfill a certain purpose, albeit holy, in the kingdom of Hashem? You are to set him apart as a ho as holy because he offers the bread of your God. He is to be holy for you because I, Adonai, who makes you holy, am holy. Amen. So it appears that those who are, are ministering in the presence of and representing Hashem, they need to be holy. As I am holy, Hashem says. The daughter of a Cohen who profanes herself by prostitution profanes her father. She is to be put to death by fire. Now I want to say, in those times, I would say things were much harsher. The Messiah had not come yet. Yep. And offered up the ultimate sacrifice for atonement for all peoples and it clearly amongst the the Levites in Israel made a clear point to not engage in those things the Cohen who is ranked highest among his brothers the one whose head the anointing oil is poured and who is consecrated to put on garments. He's not to stop grooming his hair. He's to stay away from uncleanness, dead bodies. He may not leave the sanctuary or profane the sanctuary of his God because the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is on, his head, on him. I am Adonai. Now, 
This may seem a little boring, but in the context of the environment that they were living in at that time, what's the core number one thing? Honoring Yehovah's ways. Being mindful. These are his mitzvot. These are mitzvot. These things apply. The principles of them apply in this world today. And I've said this last week. There's a horrific level of disrespect and honor and reverence for the presence of God. We just think, I mean, it's great to praise the Lord, but you've got to know when you're in the presence of the Lord or what presence you're in. And I say that very carefully because sometimes you don't know what presence you're in. It may look like A, but it's actually B. And as we get closer to the end of days, and be aware of this, as we get closer to the return or, and I respect my brothers, the coming of the Moshiach, we'll all ask him that same question. Is this the first or the second time you've been here? We're all going to ask him. We'll find out. In the meantime, it ought not be something that separates us. We ought to come together on what we embrace, and that is the Torah. And so, we see that a, a Kohen is not to be married, it is to marry. A Kohen is to marry a virgin. He may not marry a widow, a divorcee, a profaned woman or prostitute, and again, profaned woman can simply be just of a different order within the nation of Israel. They were to marry within the tribe, the Aaronic line. The tribe, their own tribe. They had to marry their own tribe, their own. Right, exactly. Yeah, tribe, not exactly. Yes. So, God lays out some strict orders and boundaries. It says he must marry a virgin from among his own people and not disqualify his descendants among his people because I am Adonai who makes him holy. Now we may say, oh, I should marry, and you know, but God's saying something special to the Levites. You disqualify yourself. You need to be with an individual or a spouse that is of the same tribe, the same faith, the faith, the same mindset, the same heart, a wholeheartedness towards the things of God. If they're not committed not going to last. If they're really not committed through the struggle, the difficulties, the disappointments, the poverty, struggle, not going to work. But those who are trusting in Hashem know that all things will work together to accomplish God's purposes in that couple's lives, regardless of what they face. It says, no one with a defect may approach the Holy of Holies. No one blind, no one lame, with a mutilated face or a limb too long. With a broken foot, broken arm, hunched back, stunted growth, a cataract eye. Can you imagine that? Why did God set out to be in that list? 
a person that has a cataract eye, they're not to enter in to the Holy of Holies. One with festering or running sores or damaged testicles. I find it interesting. Do you notice anyone within that list of defects is missing? Kind of puzzled at that. I don't understand why. Can you think of any kind of defect that he didn't mention? That evidently is not part of it. A deaf person is not in there. There is not a deaf person. It's interesting. I don't know why. Maybe I'll find out. So, no one descended from Aharon the Cohen who has such a defect may approach to present the offerings for Adonai made by fire. He has a defect and is not to approach to offer the bread of his God, the fire of God. He may eat the bread of his God, both especially holy and the holy. Only he is not to go into the curtain or approach the altar. Because he has a defect. So that he will not profane my holy places. Because I am Adonai who makes them holy. Well, how does he make them holy? How does he make, how does he make them holy? Anybody know? How does Hashem make the Kohen holy? Dedication. What's that? By the dedication, Let the me, willingness to serve. Absolutely. That's an attitude of the heart. That's, that's major. But could it be as simple as this? He's just supposed to do everything God orders him to do in order to be operating within the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place and the Mishkan. So if you're involved in very specific work of Yehovah, do you think he requires certain conduct, attitude, behavior, words? Why is that? Because you're representing him. to the hearty ones. But there's, I don't think there's room for many mistakes. When you get to a certain point in your walk with the Lord, He requires things of you, just like here. He had an order. He had things He expected from you. When you don't do it, you profane Him. You, you more or less Reduce yourself to a level of really not being in the presence of Hashem. That's why we have a Yom Kippur. They're not perfect. Our leaders are not perfect. Both in the religious communities Everywhere else within the commoner's realm, world. But don't put yourself up in a place to suppose to hold certain positions that you were never meant to be there. kind of muddies the waters and it profanes 
the holiness of Yahweh. You see, it says that Aharon and his sons in chapter 22 separate themselves from the holy things of the people, Israel, which they set apart as holy for me, so that they will not profane my holy name, I am Adonai. Well, here you see, God's saying, what's holy that holds you to a certain standard in my presence, because you're not in the presence of the Mishkan, or in the holy place, or in the holy of holies behind the parachet. You're, you're not in that circle. So, it's important you know that. And as those who are just common individuals, they don't belong in the Holy of Holies. Because when they do that, they don't know the order, they don't know God's ways and how to handle all those things. And again, I want to say, fast forward to present day. Some people are involved in areas where they really don't belong. You got to know where God's called you, what He's called you to do. You got to seek Him. And guess what? Like He said, if you seek Me, you'll find Me. And when you find Me, when you seek Me with all your heart, then you'll find Me, and I'll reveal unto you My hidden mysteries. But what are those hidden mysteries? Well, what God created you for. What he called you for. It's not that complicated. You want to know, he wants you to know. He wants you to operate in a place where his name is not profaned. With the tools and the gifts and the talents and abilities that he's given you to carry out. And we go over into uh, chapter 21, 22, verse 8. I just want to ask you if you ever heard this kind of phraseology in the Gospels and the Epistles. Because it was here first. It's really interesting. Verse 8, but he is not to eat anything that dies naturally or is torn to death by wild animals and thereby make himself unclean. Does anybody know where that, that comes from? Where in the epistles would you find that? Well, when Paul was speaking to the new pagan converts to basically Messianic Judaism or Judaism, really Messianic Judaism was not pretty much any different, all the mitzvot, all the culture and everything were, were all resident and present. The only difference was the Messianics believed that Yeshua was the, Mosh, was the, uh, the Moshiach. And that goes into deeper. I'd love to speak with any of you if you have any question on where that goes and how that all works itself out through the, the Torah. It's all there. But that's in the epistles, again, as I said, the pagans, when they converted, most, pretty much all the Jews, as they were participating in the Ramon. service, they, they didn't uh, adhere nor did they even know of those, those mitzvot. So how could they operate within the scope of uh, what Hashem required amongst, amongst the common man in Judaism? Like I said, everything else is the same. The only difference is that they acknowledge Yeshua was the Messiah and... There were those predominantly in Israel that believed the Mashiach 
is still to come. That's the only difference, really. So, as we see, as we move into chapter 23, this is the, this is the great chapter. <laughs> it speaks to the ordinary, ordinary Israelites and it spoke to the, the Kohen. But in chapter 23, we're observing the sacred times and seasons, such as Shabbat, Pesach, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Is anything missing? Did we miss anything? I just named them. Anybody notice anything missing? Let me read them again. We have Shabbat, Shabbat Pesach, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. One, two, three, four, five. I guess you could add these two. What about um, Elul, the blowing of the shofar? Well, that's in there, believe it or not. The, verse, the, uh, the trumpets. Verse 23. Okay, the blowing of the shofar. Yeah. It's blown beginning in the month of Elul every day. And it's it's expounded on here briefly. There's Rosh Kodesh. We're going to observe that wherever we are. Chapter 24. Chapter 24. Adonai said to Moshe, Order the people of Israel to bring you pure oil from crushed olives for the light, to keep lamps burning always. It's kind of interesting today. I just have to say this. Somebody brought this today. <laughs> what? I mean, what timing? Just, just gave it to me today as a gift. And it's mentioned in this parsha that it should always be lit. we got to do something about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you still have one with lights. we're in different times, and it's not exactly a, a mishkan, but a temple. But the point's well taken. The point's well taken. Said that, bring the oil, the crushed olives for the light to keep lamps burning always outside the curtain of the testimony in the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting. Right in here. There it is. Okay. I didn't, I, <laughs> I got to work on getting pictures so people can see it. I'm not, I'm not real... Not keen on putting that all together in, in a, you know, in a uh, professional, professional, you know, presentation. So I find this interesting. There is the same thing. Now, isn't that interesting? This was ancient, and it's going to be rebirthed when they build the new temple. So this, the eternal light, has filled the space, the purpose of the menorah for thousands of years. Isn't that interesting? And this is on, always. This stays on. That's the only thing lit in this shul. 
continuously. And what a beautiful sight. What a beautiful sight. Just walking, because I have to go out this way to, to leave every night. But what, what a beautiful, I, I can't explain it. It's just so, it's heavenly. It's the presence of Hashem. That's what they were doing the other night, the kids. At where? The kids the other night. Oh. They were just sitting here because it got darker and they were just kind of watching and talking. Oh, and, wow. Now that, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. They had made a comment that they were just, just wow. enjoying the, the ambiance. It is. It, it's, it's precious. And where I live, there's a den that is, is all things from the Holy Land in that room and it's a it's a room that's set aside for prayer okay Fun. and um, my mother I said can, can I put the eternal light in where the lights are on the fireplace instead of just regular regular you know Western electric bulbs. Oh, I didn't advertise him. <laughs> no, but no, really. Um, and I just, I just moved in. I uh, had been away for, you know. But she's become a, a grand, not a grand, a, a, a god. She's become my godmother over the years in a very special way. It's been a tremendous help to me in my life. And so. It's interesting. We have some real examples of the transition from the menorah in the Mishkan to the temple to the eternal light here in the modern day synagogue, and it's going to revert back to that menorah. It will. Just hold your hold your seat belts on. It's going to happen. So. So, you know, these things, through the ebb and flow of the struggles, of the ups and downs of Israel, and the waning and rebellion and idol worship, uh, in Ezekiel 44, 15 to 31, I'll just read the first paragraph, says, the Kohanim, who are Leveim and descendants of Zadok. Okay. Zadok. Look that up on your own time. Who's Zadok? <laughs> who took care of my sanctuary when the people of Israel went astray from me. They are the ones who will approach me and serve me. It is they who attend me. And offer me the fat and the blood, says Adonai Elohim. They will enter my sanctuary, approach my table to minister to me, and perform my service. You know, being a Levite and a priest and a king, you're actually ministering to the creator of the universe. Then in Matthew, Metayahu 5, 38 to 42, it says, You have heard that our fathers were told, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to stand up against someone who does you wrong. Now why would you do that? Why? You want to know why? Because God is a God of mercy, grace, and compassion. His first response to us is to show mercy, is to show grace, and to show compassion. Isn't it kind of interesting 
that the nature and the character of Israel has always been to hold back? Do we, when we're attacked, we look at history? Was our first response to strike back immediately? No. No. We've shown mercy and grace, compassion to all the circumstances surrounding the events that have taken place in Israel. On the contrary, if someone hits you on the right cheek, let him hit you on the left cheek too. If someone wants to sue you for your shirt, let him have your coat as well. Give him your coat. And if a soldier forces you to carry his pack for one mile, carry it too. When someone asks for you, when someone asks you for something, give it to him. When someone wants to borrow something from you, lend it to him. Why is that? Why is that? You don't own it. God owns it. He gave it to you. You'll be held accountable for how you use what he's given you. It's that simple. In the end of the day, it's all going to come right back to his feet. Very interesting. You know, here's some... I mean, these are words written by Messianic Jews of that era, 2,000 years ago, 1,800 years ago. These are Jewish principles. Very interesting. Israel's a reflection of the life and lifestyle in the attitudes of Yeshua may not even realize it. Then in Galatians 3, 26 to 29, and hear this, hear this loud and clear, hear this, all whose ears are tuned in to hear for in union with the Messiah, you are all children of God through this trusting faithfulness. Because as many of you as were immersed into the Messiah, Jew and Gentile, pagan, any, anyone that believed, As many of you as were immersed into the Messiah have clothed yourselves with the Messiah, meaning His righteousness. His righteousness, which is oriented to clothe you with salvation. In whom there is neither Jew nor Gentile. And as I've mentioned to you before in my 11-week series, the title of that series, that teaching was, Who are the Jews? And who are the Gentiles? Where did they come from? Did God always, were there always Jews here? Well, no, there weren't. Well, why? Why did God gather in the descendants of Abraham and eventually establish the nation of Israel? Did you know it was because he loved you and 
before the flood, they weren't interested in the Torah. They weren't interested in God's ways. But he found one. He found Abraham. And it was because of Abraham's unwavering trust in the course of what appeared the most illogical act to have done by a follower of Jehovah to sacrifice his son on an altar. You should look into that. It's far deeper and wider of an expression of the creator of the universe right along the lines of mercy, grace, compassion, and not just for Isaac, but for mankind. He was projecting down into the future his way of redeeming, reconciling, and restoring mankind the way he intended. His plan will not falter. It will not fail. Believe me, I'd encourage you to get on board. And so, in a quick review, this portion of the Torah contains many laws and instructions for the priests, for the descendants of Aharon, who are responsible for maintaining the sanctity of the tabernacle and later the temple. Among these laws are the requirements for physical purity. As a believer, God expects us to be pure and holy physically. He wants to perfect us. Prohibited us from coming into contact with corpses and the rules for offering sacrifices. See, but Amor speaks to us, the ordinary Israelites, the ordinary believers, who are not part of the priestly class. And that's okay. It teaches us about the importance of observing Hashem's sacred times and seasons. Bear in mind, these are not Jewish holidays. They happen to be associated with people that follow Jehovah's feasts and festivals. They were never, you look in the Torah, it doesn't say they belong to Jehovah. Shvat, Pesach, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. It reminds us that we are a holy nation and a holy people, and I say both Jew and Gentile, who embrace the Creator, Jehovah. We were chosen to be a light to the nations. And that choosing and that call is irrevocable. Irrevocable. It challenges us to live up to our calling and to honor Jehovah our God with our words and deeds. The world's pretty deplete of all those things right now, wouldn't you say? One of the most striking verses in, in Amor, in Leviticus 24, 22, that all the world should be mindful of, because it's coming. It says, you shall have one standard for strangers and citizens alike. For I, the Lord, Jehovah, am your God. 
This verse comes after a case where blasphemy was committed by a man. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with him. Yep. But then God also came in that there, that there should be no distinction, no distinction between stranger and citizen in matters of justice and equity. God's kingdom is equitable. It's just. And it's right. Not like we're seeing across the world today. No. Not even close. His ways will be established and reestablished. You see, everyone should be treated fairly and equitably under the law. This verse shows us that God cares not only about our, our ritual purity, but also about our ethical purity. God wants us to be compassionate and generous towards those who are different from us, who may not share our faith or culture or background. God wants us to respect the dignity and rights of every human being created in God's image. Not to take advantage of your neighbor. Not to act out violence when you can't have your way. You're not the only one in the world. The world does not revolve around you. It revolves around Yehovah. Amen. And it's what He desires, what He wants for us that is paramount. God wants us to respect the dignity and rights of every human being created. God's image. God wants us to emulate God's own love and mercy, which are extended to all people, to us, by the grace of Jehovah, of Hashem. And as we've read and studied more today, let us reflect on how we can apply its teaching to our lives, how we can speak with encouraging words, blessing and not curse, positive, not negative comments, critical comments, and hurtful words. How can we sanctify our time and space with prayer and gratitude? You know, it says, the path to the most happiest life is a heart that's grateful and thankful. Do you wake up every morning saying, thank you that I'm alive today? When I walk in here, I say, thank you, Jehovah, for allowing me into your house. This is your house. It's not mine. I've just been so blessed to be able to walk into it and to do what he called me to do. Not what I want to do. I'm really trying to focus in on where and how I spend my time. You see, prayer and gratitude is, is an integral part of your life. And prayer is talking with Hashem. How can we uphold justice and kindness for ourselves and others? How can we be holy as God is holy? And how we honor, how we, we revere Him. And our neighbor. Do we see this in our communities? Our local governments? Townships? Boroughs? Villages? Counties? Regions, states, country, our nation. Just remember all those boundary names and map 
boundaries. They're made up of people. We need to realize in our daily lives that we cross one of those paths. And just as love your neighbor as yourself, you say you love Hashem, Yehovah, you got to start with your neighbor. Because that proves to God that you love Him. We can all be islands unto ourselves, but I dare to say that Jehovah is not there. <laughs> He's not there. He's with the people. He's reaching out to neighbors that are reaching out to neighbors. Hallelujah. See, believers in one Echad with God, with Jehovah, Jew and Gentile, for all the nations. May God, may Jehovah, may Hashem help us to answer these questions and to live according to his will, his way, and his order, and seek it out. That's how you find them. Baruch Hashem. Thank you. It was I who made you, formed you.